Thanks everybody for coming back for the last session. So um, this is sort of a special session. Um, as we all know, the pandemic has been really hard on everybody. And this session is to honor the students who completed their PhDs during the pandemic and didn't have the pomp and circumstance that we, uh, some of us have also had the ability to have. So uh, we have four talks today by Astro 3D members who finished their PhDs just recently. So we'll start off with Joe. Thank you so much, Emily. Hi, everyone. My name is Jana or Joe Chuka, and I am a multi-purpose, sorry, a dual postdoc working at a School of Computing and the Research School for Astronomy and Astrophysics at ANU. And today I'll be talking to you about unsupervised learning for model for stellar spectra using deep normalizing flows, uh, type of generative models. This work is in done in very close collaboration with Professor Jan Santing who has been extremely instrumental um, in, in his help and support in getting me here to Australia. The, I would also like to acknowledge and be very, very grateful to a few key people who helped me get from Romania, where I was after I finished my PhD, and I, uh, to, to come here to Australia at the NUS and resume my research. So these are Professor Matthew Fales, Professor Lisa Kiwi, Ingrid and Christy, and yeah, I'm super grateful to all of you. And I hope that uh, we get to continue to work together in the future. Uh, yeah, so I'm originally from Romania, as you can see there, and that's not the plane I came here with. <laughs> So my research field is galactic archaeology. Galactic archaeology has been re revolutionized over the last few years by the insanely, insanely big amount of data that we have from missions such as Gaia, Gala, Apogee, and many, many others. So in galactic archaeology, we have so far employed supervised learning to pretty much solve a label determination problem. This, what I mean by that is we want to, observe, to map the observed spectra to a set of features that we're interested in for our study, such as chemical abundances. This is powerful. By getting the data-driven chemical abundances for hundreds of thousands of stars, we can understand more about the dimensionality of the, of the Milky Way and uh, you know, solve galactic chemical evolution. However, this is limited because we have very few stars with high fidelity stellar labels such as temperature, surface, gravity, and metallicity that we need for training. And the more, uh, more features and the more information we want to predict, the more we need in our training set, which makes the problem even more challenging. This is also very dangerous because data-driven abundances could lead to the wrong conclusions. Uh, such work has been pioneered by Daniel Lacker, uh, who I'm not sure if he's here today in the audience, but he's done a great work on the Nix stream, which we've seen in the halo of our, of our galaxy. And we believe Nix to be associated with a disrupted dwarf system, but uh, using the Rayvon data-driven um, chemical abundances. But then he did, he did look at uh, that structure using a lot of data, and he found that that same structure that we believe to be a new thing is actually pre-boring thick disk stars, uh, you know, which is, Revealing in and of itself, but it's not the exciting thing we all thought it was. And moving forward, we have to be very careful about doing such type of analysis because uh, science has one too. Uh, right, but before we delve further in why I think unsupervised learning can tell us a lot more about galactic archaeology, I first want to sort of um, clarify what I mean, what I mean what I speak when I say, when I, what I mean when I speak about supervised or unsupervised learning. Because to name is to know, and these concepts are being thrown out there, but very few people actually take the time and say, okay, this is actually what it means. And I want to credit uh, Ava Soleimani from MIT for her great work in sort of um, showcasing the difference between these two type uh, fields of studies in deep learning. So on one hand, supervised learning, we have the data X and the uh, label Y. And the goal here is to create a map between the data space X and the Y. So think about it, features of a cat, cat, features of a dog, dog. And this is very useful for classification or regression um, tasks. Do you know, if we want to predict the price of a car, if we have the features of the car, this is the perfect way to do it. 
unlike unsupervised learning, where we have just the data X, we don't have any labels, we just have uh, images of the cat, but we don't actually have the cat label. And the goal here is to learn the underlying structure of the data, learn what processes generated the data that we see. And this is very important for tasks such as dimensionality reduction or clustering. I'm sure that many of you have seen or work directly with things like a principal component analysis and so on. There are many of them, uh, very important to name our variational autoencoders, generative adversarial networks, and the ones that I will be speaking to you today called normalizing flows. But before we go there, now that we have honed in on the unsupervised learning of deep learning, uh, we want to hone in further and talk to you about generative models. So generative models, they solve, solve an unsupervised learning task. So what I mean by that is that given an input of a training sample, we want to learn a model that best represents the distribution from which these observed data were drawn. Formally, we want to learn the probability distribution over a random variable X from a set that, of data that we've observed that's characterized, characterized by probability density P of X parameterized by uh, uh, parameter space theta. Now that we know what generative model is, it's important to think about what are the goals of generative modeling. There are two main goals of generative modeling. One of them is density estimation. So once we have learned the PDF of the data this, that we're interested in, we can use this PDF to evaluate the likelihood of a new point under this data. And you can already in, have an intuition of why this is very important, because this is a very powerful application for outlier detection, especially in very high dimensional systems that are hard to um, have a, a sort of a physical understanding of. And it's also very important to build informative priors that we can then sort of, uh, how does it work? Right, oh, it has its own mind. Well, hello. Um, yeah, so we want, we can also build informative priors that we can put down further the chain in, for example, invasion analysis. At the same time, there's another goal that we're also very happy about. It's called sample generation. So once we have learned the PDF, we can also draw new samples from the same PDF. And why are we interested in this? Because it's fun to sample new faces, paintings, and text, as open AI and deep mind would like us to think. But, you know, for example, in social science and uh, social policy work, this type of sample generation um, application is also very important because it allows us to uncover bias in data and therefore create fairer models by debiasing. And in science, it's a very powerful method to identify correlation structure in very high dimensional data sets like the ones I work with that have over thousands, many thousands of dimensions. All right, so uh, now I think we're like halfway through the talk. So I decided to put this slide there to guide my, uh, the next few slides. So I pose a question to you, which one do you think this uh, isn't real? And I hope some of you see what I did there with AI. Um, yeah, the fact that it didn't land quickly means it wasn't a good job on my side. Uh, right, so one of these spaces is not real. And I promise I'm not trying to trick you, the other three are real. And if you get the right answer, all right, I'm going, <laughs> I'm going to use my very fancy new card that I got after my PhD uh, to buy you a coffee after, after the session um, tomorrow. So just, yeah, just you have a lot of um, incentive here. Right, cool. Going back to, we talked about unsuper we talked about supervised learning for, for galactic archaeology. We saw how that can be limited. And then we moved on to unsupervised learning. And then we went to generative modeling. And now we are honing it even further. We're honing in on a type of generative model, uh, generative learning models, which is called the norm normalizing flow, which is trying to solve this task to create a model X that is as similar as possible to the, to the model that from which that data was generated. And I know my talk is very limited in time, so I'll try not to puff too much, but what we're trying, what normalizing flows are primarily trying to do is take a very complicated probability space, like the one that's spent by stellar spectra in many, many dimensions, and morph it and mold it into one that's more easily tractable, like the Gaussian multivariate. So unlike variational encoders, we're not moving into a lower dimensionality, such as we do with PCA, we're keeping the dimensions the same. So we're just moving from a very, very complex space to one that's much simpler and easier to understand, like the Gaussian space. And the idea here, we do this via a function or a transformation f. And this f, you know, 
Um, as we move between these two probability spaces, we have to have a conservation of mass probability. So as we make a change in DZ, for example, we have to follow the same change. We have to see it reflected in the probability in X and so on. And this change in, in um, this change in, in pretty much in volume is quantified by the uh, determinant of the trans Jacobian of the, uh, of the transformation. And I promise I won't put many details about the maths, but I think this is a very important way to follow. So from X, we move to Z through a transformation F, and then we quantify that change via the determinant of the Jacobian. Now, from my very rusty knowledge of linear algebra, um, calculating the determinant of a very high dimensional Jacobian is very, very tricky. So in order for this to be a viable method, we need to enforce two, uh, two different, uh, <laughs> thank you for that universe. <laughs> Two, two different conditions. So one is the Jacobian has to be efficiently computable, the determinant of the Jacobian. And secondly, we want the neural network DF to actually be invertible. So once we have mapped to Gaussian where we do all the magic, all the, all the things that we can possibly want, like sample new faces, evaluate the likelihood, we want to transform that back into the original space. So then we can, do, we can come to our scientific colleagues and say, hey, this actually makes sense. Right, so my work so far has been work using uh, this, this normalizing flow method on stellar spectra. And I worked very closely with Jan Sen and we used his method, the pain, which is a spectral emulator to create 20,000 apogee-like synthetic stellar spectra. Uh, and in order to derate this uh, his synthetic stellar spectra, we pretty much varied all these abundant spaces from carbon to titanium, to cobalt, to nickel, and then we also allowed a bit of change in the temperature and the surface gravity. So now we have this training space. And then we train on the stellar spectra and this spectrum has 2000 dimensions and the metallicity temperature log G. We use a normalizing flow. We create this P of Z, this Gaussian thing. We train it and we learn the distribution. And then we use it for two purposes. One of them is to generate new samples and to pull science with. And the other one is to find chemical outliers. And I just want to um, also be very thankful to the NCI Gadi because this model is very huge. It has over 1 billion parameters and it was trained multi node, multi GPU on 16 GPUs, uh, which took actually 95% of the time uh, to do this project. Right, cool. So, first application we wanted to get new samples, new stellar spectra once we have, um, once we've trained the model. And then on this spectra, what I pretty much did, I just pre selected because this is still like, we're still testing the method. I pre-selected the features that are associated with strong atomic transition. And these are the pixels that for which those features are there. And this are, is unordered. You know, this could be titanium, nickel, and so on. Um, and then what I did is I applied a, quite a, a, a new graph analysis method to reorder this matrix. And then this is what we got. Work, yo, hello. Cool, thank you. <laughs> We got this, right? So um, once we have pretty much sampled one million new spectra, we have this unordered correlation matrix, we ordered it. And then the normalizing flow was able to recover as the main family, the elemental lines. And this is with noise in both uh, pixels, in both spectra and labels. So this is conditioned on temperature and log G in the sense that I only selected spectra within 50, with the same 50, Kelvin difference. And I am very happy to explain more um, after the talk. Right. And the second application was outlier detection. So, you know, I trained on this 4,100 to 4,300 Kelvin log G, whatever, pre much solar abundance uh, pattern. And then I generated new weird stars. I'm not an expert in this, so uh, it's still, uh, I'm still getting there. But, and then once I generated these new stars, like CMP stars that Gary talked us about, or strip stars, or very rapidly rotating stars, I passed them under the model. I said, how likely are you under the model? And you see here on the right side that the further away it moves from the training distribution there, the less likely they are under the model. So in this, uh, this sort of concludes my, well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is sad. Right. Uh, where's the last slide? Oh, well, here you go. Right. Long story short, this concludes my talk, and we're very excited to apply this to the actual Gala data and find super cool stuff in the future once the GPUs have finished training. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure.